those of you that were here last week, we were talking about how the Civil War transformed the United States. And, and we tend to, when we teach U.S. history, it's sort of U.S. history until the war, you know, and it depends on how instructors divide it, but it's first half of U.S. history, usually U.S. to 1865, second half 1865 to current, um, because some of those early colonial times can be compressed a little bit and you can move forward more quickly. So last week we talked about one of the aspects or several of the aspects as far as relating to the West with the end of the American Civil War was this transformation that begins. Um, and part of that is spurred on by, by the horrors of war, quite, quite frankly, you know, the loss of family members, the destruction of land, the destruction of the economy, the South and, and its um, position seeing itself as having lost the war, you know, where do I go from now if my lifestyle is changing? So last week, as we looked at the West, we talked a lot about immigration, uh, talked quite a bit about, you know, it's during that period right after the war that you begin to have a number of immigrants. We had the Irish coming in 1840s. We had a lot who came prior to that, but you have a lot of the Irish, the Germans, uh, Eastern Europeans coming in in the 1840s because of the revolutions of 1848 that really split Europe apart. A lot of those were religious wars. They were wars over monarchy versus, you know, republicanism, self-identification. So a lot of people are going to leave and come to the U.S. Well, once the Civil War is over and that next wave of immigration, we're first going to see a lot of Scandinavian folks who will come in and come into the Midwest, the Swedes, uh, the Norwegians, the Danes, uh, not as much from Finland, but some, but it's predominantly those other three Scandinavian countries. And by the time we get to the 1880s on the West Coast, we have the Chinese more than any of the other Asians at that point coming in. They will be joined by others later. Um, we have Russians coming in, some who are trying to get away, but we also you know, just have this expansion of immigration and of course, we talked last week a little bit about how that ends up with, with so many of the American native uh, tribes being relocated, and in some cases, quite frankly, being fairly decimated because of their unwillingness to relocate because they, they had been on the land for hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, it's also a period of time that we're gonna very rapidly, because of that movement to the West, see new states, new territories that then are large enough enough population they can apply for statehood. So you have this, this huge push for states that will occur between the end of the American Civil War and about 1920. And we will pretty much be at our 48 contiguous states by, the, by 1920. So, you know, this huge period of growth there. And then the thing that we love to talk about the most and that I really wanted to wallow in a lot more today because I, I have that lure of the Western frontier, you know, having camped all across the West and, you know, the, the beauty and the grandeur of the landscape and the whole, and a lot of its mythology based on truth, but that whole myth of the cowboys and, you know, that, that lone person on the range and changing the face of the West. You know, I, obviously I watched one too many John Wayne, uh, Joel McRae, you know, Randolph Scott, all of those sorts of Alan Ladd Western. See, the fact that I can name that many of them off the top of my head tells you what my dad watched on Saturday afternoons and Saturday nights. But we have this, um, this lure of the Western frontier. And part of that too is that image of, you know, the cattle towns and the gunslingers and, and the, uh, the fights, you know, whether it's OK Corral or whether it's you know, in the streets, you know, so many of us who are my age remember growing up and watching Gunsmoke and, and Bonanza and all those others. So, you know, that's sort of what we talked about last week. This week, we're going to talk about how the U.S. began to transform after the Civil War in other areas. So, Suzette, we can go to the next slide. Um, and we're going to take a look at what what many historians will refer to the beginning of the end of an agrarian republic. You know, if you look back and you think about colonies, even those colonies where you had 
whaling and you had um, a bit of a different lifestyle in New England with a merchant class society and all that, it, we were still predominantly an agrarian nation. Um, in fact, if you, if you look at the U.S. Census, for those of us who love to do genealogy and love to pour over the census, we will really remain an agrarian nation until about 1950 when you suddenly begin to have a tipping of more people living in large cities than you do spread out in small towns, small communities. But the beginning of the end occurs following the American Civil War and we're going to see you know, we have these abstract terms that we use whenever we talk about the end of that period. Um, for some reason, the music from Green Acres is playing in the, my, the background of my mind because I see that word professionalism and it's that shift from that period of our history that Jefferson would have described as the yeoman farmer. You know, the beauty of, of hands in the soil, planting the crops, watching them grow up and being part of this national experience. And that will begin to be replaced by industrialization, by urbanization. You know, after the Civil War, you have a, a large black uh, exodus out of the South into Chicago and other cities in the North. But you also just have people who, because of industrialization, because of the desire to live in the cities, moving to the cities, it also, the end of the Civil War sort of shifts us not always willingly, but it shifts us to more of a sense of nationalism, where before we still tended to be as we had been as colonial figures, we tended to identify with our state or our region. So if someone had said to me, where are you from? I might have said, I'm a southerner, I'm from Tennessee, where now you know we most often identify that we are citizens of the United States of America, or we will say we're Americans, even though that's not a real accurate description. Um, we're gonna see a move more to centralization where decisions are being made less at the local level. And that's an issue that people still fight over. You know, What percentage of the decisions that impact our daily life should be made locally? What percentage of them then do you rely on states? and at, at what part of them really can only best be done at the national level. And the answer to that question certainly has changed. And professionalism is the last of it. We are going to be moving from a period where even those who were professionals, doctors, lawyers, and others, were still more often associated with small town values. Uh, doctors made house calls. You know, attorneys studied for the law, some of them at universities, but a lot of them, even up until the Civil War, studied with other attorneys. You know, that image of Lincoln studying by candlelight. We're going to move more and more to professionalism, licensing, um, all those sorts of things that will change the way we live our lives. So, you know, if you think about all of that, the American Civil War really is sort of a watershed event in our history almost every aspect of our nation changes in some way, economic, political, uh, even our cultural life, all of it's going to be altered as we all struggle to understand what happened. You know, sometimes when I talk with folks who are from other countries and they will say, well, you all spend so much time, it seems like, focused on your American Civil War. And I will you know, my answer to that is yes, because in some ways, unlike the British Civil War, the English Civil War and the English Bill of Rights, and certainly they spend the next 230 years struggling with what does that equality mean? It's taken us a long time and we still struggle with all of that. So, you know, how do you define the Civil War is one of the issues that coming out of it that we'll talk about, you know, it was a battle to preserve the union. Certainly that was Lincoln's first and foremost. Uh, was it a crusade for freedom? Yes, it was in the mind of some people. Was the American Civil War a triumph for equality? Well, certainly on paper, it looks like it is, but in reality, that's gonna be a long and arduous struggle. Was it a, a tragic clash between different cultures. Did the Northern colonies and the Southern colonies, were they destined from the beginning to be so dissimilar in their economic and political practices that they would end up in conflict? Maybe. 
Was it a failed war for Southern independence? You know, that one I always struggle with because as much as you read all of the articles of secession and all those issues, I'm not so sure that it was so much a war for independence as it was for economic independence. Politically, if they could have worked out an agreement, I think most of the Southern leaders would have been happy to stay in the Union if they could have kept their lifestyle, their, their economy. Um, was it a battle based on capitalism versus agrarian? In some ways, probably so. So let's talk about all of that and, and think about what it, what it really means. So let's go to a pivotal event. The next slide shows you a picture from a pivotal event that sort of explains how we're going to shift our national direction. So this is a major event, May the 18th, 1865, the Grand Review of the Union. And this was something that was planned by the, the US Army, the War Department. Now you've got to remember, this is only 39 days after Appomattox. So this is pretty quickly coming at the end of the war. You know, Joe Johnston does not surrender his troops in the Carolinas until, you know, 10, 11 days after Appomattox. Some of the fighting in Texas and the Western states really doesn't end until about this period of time. So what is this grand review all about and what are they trying to say? So it's a, a grand review of the union that was ordered by the War Department. And you have primarily Meade's troops, which is the Army of Northern Virginia. You have all of Sherman's troops and they come into Washington, DC. About 200,000 of them. And on those days, May the 18th and May the 8th, 19th of 1865, you're going to have this huge victory parade. They didn't build it as a victory parade. They, they built it as a review of the military troops, which is a, a typical military sort of thing. You have a review of the troops. We'll have a review of the troops. Actually, the review of the parade and the troops who will be marching at the Armed Forces Day Parade here in Chattanooga on May the 6th, the Commandant of the U.S. Marine Corps will be here and will be our reviewing officer. So that's sort of a standard thing. The difference here is... You have 200,000 men marching in uniform through Washington, D.C. It takes them two days to stage the parade because it is 25 miles in land. So they will stage the parade, they will take a break, and then they pick up the second day with the rest of the parade. And it's this steady flow of blue uniforms, troops, cannons, spectators jam the streets, they're in the windows, they're on the sidewalks. What's interesting is when the War Department planned it, they really thought it would just sort of be a, you know, we have preserved the nation's capital, everyone in Washington and the government would come out and there would be a hip hip hurrah. What ended up happening was that spectators, because the word got out that the troops were coming home. Think about you know, ticker tape parades in New York City after World War I, Alvin C. York coming home, all the other heroes of the Great War, you know, think about the troops coming home from World War II. And people came from hundreds of miles away to see this. There had never been a parade like this before. There had not been a parade of, of this kind at the end of the American Revolution. We were so disjointed. Travel was so difficult. There hadn't been one at the end of the War of 1812. So this is really kind of a, a fascinating event and it it signaled the purpose for the War Department was a signal of national power, national unity, national governments, and a national consciousness. The war is over. We're going to reform or transform this nation. Um, Walt Whitman was there. And for those of us who grew up reading Leaves of Grass and other Whitman things, he writes a beautiful essay about this grand review and he says, magnificent sight, you know, the returning armies. But the truth of the matter is the armies really weren't from DC. They were from all across the North. There were Yankees there from New England. There were farm boys from the Midwest. And at this time, remember Midwest is Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, and then those territories, states 
that were indeed west of the Mississippi. You've got the Irish boys from Boston, and, and there had been so much talk of the Irish brigades during the war. You've got freed Southern slaves who've taken up arms, and they will march in their own units in all of this. And they are now assembled together in this na great national military force. And it's, it's just really interesting. It, it looks so different to those people who are in Washington because they remembered how rough and how ragged many of the troops looked when the war began, when Lincoln first called for conscripts, for draftees, or for volunteers. This army had come together as an army, and it sort of tells us, gives us a foreboding of what's about to come. Now, you have to wonder, the people watching the parade, what were they really thinking? Were they... You know, were they excited? Were they happy about this new beginning for the nation, this new, as, as Lincoln had said, this new birth of freedom? Were they harboring worries? You know, you have to remember that not everybody agreed with this idea of centralization of power for the regime. Patrick Henry, and one of the reasons Patrick Henry would not participate in the Constitutional Convention was that he had hinted at what he called a centralization of power that was incompatible with the genius of republicanism. That's, that's a, a really cool phrase coming out of give me liberty or give me death, Patrick Henry. But he, he actually said he smelled, he smelled something rotten in all of the plans. So he did not want to be a part of that. So let's talk about what kinds of, of changes were going to occur and how they occur. So probably the major change other than westward expansion that occurs coming out of the American Civil War is that the United States will be transformed into a major industrial power worldwide. And it will begin with the end of the American Civil War. Um, industrialization is not just a product of the war. It, it actually had begun in small ways prior to the war, had continued some during the war, and it probably would have occurred more rapidly had there not been that five year break for the war. But we have to think about that in 1865, American industrial power was inferior to every major European power, not just the big ones, not just the Great Britons, the Frances. I mean, the United States industrial ranking in 1865 was lower than Italy's and Italy had never been a major industrial, will never be a major industrial power other than some buildup prior to World War II. And yet by 1900, the United States is gonna be the leading industrial power as far as GNP in the entire world, surpassing Great Britain, France, Russia, the other major industrial powers combined. So how does that happen? How does that happen? Uh, and the next slide will tell you a little bit about how that is able to happen. So how do we get to be a major industrial power? Well, the vastness of our land really, you know, it, we have so many natural resources. If you think about, you know, the amount, when you think of industrialization during the period that we're talking about, the deposits that are necessary, the natural deposits, you need coal you need iron ore, you need timber. Think about how much of, of Europe had been depleted of its timber or how difficult it was to harvest what remained. You need copper, you need other mineral wealth and the United States has all of that. From 1865 until 1900, our GNP will grow by about 4% every year. That's twice what Britain, the second most industrial power in the world, will be experiencing during that same period. Their GNP will run 1.8 to 2 percent a year. So we're doubling them, and we are, you know, that will begin to exponentially grow. Um, growing population, it's it's kind of fascinating when you think about it. But once the war is over, once you have a lot of a people going on in Europe, you've got the revolutions of of the 1848s, which had triggered that first great um, 
immigration period, but then you have turmoils all across Europe. You've got the Austro-Hungarian Empire coming together and, and you've got conflicts with the Hungarians. And then you've got Germany trying to con come together. They will not unify until 1870. Italy will not unify until 1870. So you've got conflicts between all these provinces that are being mushed together to create these new nations, these new empires in some cases. So you've got a tremendous amount of immigration. Our population in this country will triple from 1865 to 1900. Now, some of that is natural population growth from our families, but an awful lot of that's going to be immigration. Because you have population increasing, you have an increasing domestic market. The more people you have, the more goods that they need. And as those people, some of them, many of them begin to settle, immigrants do into urban areas, they're not gonna be able to produce their own goods. So they become this domestic market. Uh, intensive labor growth. And it's gonna be fueled by those hundreds of thousands of immigrants coming in from Europe and Asia who are willing to do jobs in the, the beginning industries. And some of those jobs that are not particularly you know, great working conditions, long hours, not great pay, but compared to what they had seen that they had left behind, this was a new beginning and this looked far better. So they were willing to work those sorts of jobs. Um, and as we become more industrialized, the, the access to expansive capital really will change the face of the nation. You know, industrialization takes capital. We're going to have not only investment from the US, but there will be foreign nations that will invest because they see what's going to be occurring here. The next slide gives us, I think, three other, three or four other reasons. Yeah, one of them, an excellent transportation system. You know, if you're going to industrialize, if you're going to try and move those industrial centers out from just being where historically had been our pockets of, of economic growth, the New York cities, the Philadelphias, the Bostons, the Charlestons, the Savannahs, the, you know, the, uh, the Virginia port cities, New Orleans, uh, Mobile, those along the Gulf Coast, and you're gonna spread out across the nation where well, you have to have a good transportation system and and we're going to have that because as we begin to expand the railroads, the first industry that we will actually really grow after the war, but you add the railroads, that extensive network of railroads that will be developed, but you add that to the waterways, to the canals, to the natural rivers and tributaries that this country has, it's just going to it's going to make it so much easier for industrialization and, and merchandising to expand. And you add to it, we still have those world-class harbors that I've mentioned, those port cities that then allow us to not only trade internally, but you're going to see us moving into being a major world manufacturer of goods by the time we get to the early 20th century. Um, Innovation is rewarded, and, and it's kind of interesting because you look, and, and we can look at the economy of 1865 to 1900, you can look at the amassing of great wealth by individuals in a period of time when there's no income tax, and there is a direct correlation between having a system that really rewards being innovative, that rewards risk-taking. Um, you've got new inventions, you have new technologies, you've got uh, this process is fueled by a patent process. So that if I come up with a great idea and I file a patent for it, then it is my patent. I do find it interesting, you know, so many, between 1865 and 1892 or so, the number of patents that were applied for in this country would absolutely boggle your mind. And there had been so much innovation that, you know, one of the things we as historians often laugh about is the fact that in the early 1890s, the director of the U.S. Patent Office actually suggested to Congress, he said, you know, I can't imagine 
that there's anything else out there that could be invented. I'm not certain that we really need to keep the patent system in place or we even need to keep a patent office open. I've often wondered what he would have thought if he came back in you know, 1980 and had seen what had happened between 1890 and 1980 and that 90 year period of time and all of the innovation. Um, the other thing that's, that's interesting that kind of goes along with the no income tax system, the reward for being inventive, creative, taking risk is that our system of government, our cultural system, which was you know, much of it coming out of Puritan New England, that idea of hard work, strong work ethic, you know, being working hard and taking care of your family and all of that, this idea of private property. Um, we just can't, can't overstate how important that was to innovation because of this idea of whether it's intellectual property or it's real property, land that I own, or it's personal property, the goods and things that I can, can accumulate, whether I was a robber baron and I'm collecting art or all those sorts of things. I mean, it's just really kind of fascinating. And the governmental system, even for corporations at that, corporations will come in this period of time, but for businesses during this period of time, the regulation and taxation of business is gonna be light. And there are very limited protective tariffs. There is this idea that for a period of time until about the 1880s or so, that you know competition is good for the soul. So let's talk about real quickly some of those big areas. Um, the next slide I think gives you a picture of the railroad industry. Um, the first big business in the United States following the American Civil War will be this expansion of the railroads. And it, most historians believe it was the biggest driver of the economy. 1865, the war ends and we have 35,000 miles of railroad. 1900, we have 193,000 miles of railroad. Again, that's more railroad than all of Europe together, including Russia and their Trans-Siberian Railroad, which is finished about that time. Um, the first business to draw huge investments from all over the world were the railroads, you know, and it will be spurred on by innovations that will occur, you know, this manufacturing and laying of roads, the building of stations, which then draws people to towns as opposed to just um, agrarian communities where people only come together for church and school, if that, you know, they live on their farm, sort of that, um, Sarah Plain and Tall image that, that we have. And now we're gonna have small towns build up around the railroads. Um, they're gonna be building rail stations. They're gonna be erecting telegraph lines. That's gonna connect people together. Um, what's interesting, if you look back at the cost of creating this rail system, it was about $36,000 per construction mile. And that's during a period of time when the average middle-class family in the United States had about $1,000 a year of income. Now, an awful lot of agrarian families lived on much less cash income, um, but that was the average. Uh, railroads will then lead to the creation of corporations, and that, that's a change that will be created to limit, quite frankly, liability. It's a change from family-owned, friendship, partnership, sorts of uh, business, this idea. People looked back at the old joint stock companies that were used with the Virginia Company and East India Company and some of those during the colonial times. And they try to figure out a new way to do it. And the, the advantage in having those corporations is that it eliminates some of the problems that happens when your partner dies or your family member dies or you know, one member dies and that person's heir, heirs want to liquidate their portion of the business. A corporation, it really sort of moves it into a business relationship, which encourages innovation, experimentation, risk taking, but limits personal liability. And that's an interesting fact. Now, in truth, the railroads were pretty entrepreneurial in style. You know, uh, probably the most famous name associated with railroads is Cornelius Vanderbilt. Um, 
and I always find Vanderbilt's story to be kind of fascinating. You know, he starts out as a poor boy who grows up on Staten Island, who begins work with a ferry service, and then he will accumulate enough wealth that he will then have steamboats, and then he'll go from that into railroading, and he'll end up ultimately owning most of the rail lines that run between New York City, Chicago, and the other major industry, what will become the industrial or economic centers in the Midwest, places where the cattle are coming in, all those sorts of things. So how did the railroads change the face of this nation? Um, Going to move through it pretty quickly and just tell you a few facts and then we'll move on in the interest of time and look at a couple of other industries. But the railroads, um, they themselves, first of all, are having to purchase goods from other people, which will then stimulate the economy and in other industries. They're having to buy railroad cars. They're having to buy locomotives. They're having to buy the steel for tracks. They are, they are, they are probably the number one contributor to the steel industry, which will end up with a lot of people becoming wealthy. One in particular we'll talk about in a moment. In uh, 1881, 94% of all the ro rolled steel, that's the processed steel in the United States will be being utilized by the railroads. Their need for coal will fuel the coal mining industry because they need the coal to fuel the locomotives and then you know, that, that fuel is going to be really, really important. And then you're going to find that one of the things, because they're having to bring goods in from all areas, one of the problems had been that certain areas, certain states, certain regions had their own rail systems, and there was no standard gauge as far as, you know, the, the distance between the rails and, and the width of the rails and everything, which meant that if you left one region and wanted to go to another region, you literally had to stop at a crossing, load onto someone else's rail cars, and you're going to find the, that this growth in the railroads is going to push for a standardization. In 1860, there were 350 railroad companies in this nation, but no set size for gauge. By the time we get to 1900, there will be a standardized gauge. And most of the railroads are going to be owned by five or six big names that have created corporations. Um, it, the fact that we now are able to deliver goods is going to create this desire for goods, this market economy. People no longer wanted the one outfit of clothing that they wore to school or they wore out to work and then their church clothes, you know, as we have begin to have this mass processing, and we'll talk about that uh, even more, but as you begin to produce more goods, you can produce them cheaper and then people can afford to buy them. So you're gonna um, see all of that happening. You've got uh, niche goods, people who will go into business to produce everything from you know the, the glass, uh, fixtures that telegraph wires will be wrapped around, you know, just all sorts of highly customized tools that are going to be uh, necessary for this industrialization. The railroads will encourage, literally the railroad owners will encourage settlers to move to unpopulated, less populated at least, areas of, of the West because they're going to sell off the land they had to buy to be able to put the railroads through. They will sell off the land for a couple of miles on either side of it to create towns. You know, I, I laugh, I have um, three great, great aunts out of Middle Tennessee, rural county, that will marry railroaders in the 1880s and all three of the families will move to Lewiston, Montana. Sight unseen, but they get land, they begin to farm, they ranch actually and become quite, quite wealthy, but it's that draw to the land that's available to them. Um, one of the other things that, that the, the railroad industry does that we don't even think about today, and it's a standardization of time. Until the railroad industry begins to expand after the American Civil War, time was relative. <laughs> I have some family members that still think that, but time was relative because in an agrarian society, noon was considered to be that 
that point where the, the sun is at its zenith, it's at its highest point, and you sort of based your work day on when the sun came up, when the sun was at its highest peak, when the sun begins to come down. And so, you know, we have dawn and dust, and then we have um, dark, and we planned our days around that. Well, you couldn't do that if you're running a national railroad system, because what is noon for some of us in one part of the country is not noon for other parts of the country. So it's how do you schedule trains that are sharing the same rail lines and time it so that they don't run into each other, that they can all share those lines. How do you do that if you don't have a standard railroad timetable? And that's what they end up having to do. The solution is they're going to adopt, we as a nation, we as a business community will adopt standard timetables. And those standard time zones where clocks will be standardized big increase in the number of clocks. You know, lots of families didn't have clocks at that point. They might have a pocket watch that the dad wore, the granddad wore, but people didn't have watches and clocks in their homes. It wasn't necessary. You lived by looking at the signs outside, but you're gonna have standardized time zones based on geographic regions. And every town is gonna to be told, what is your standardized time zone? What most people don't realize is that decision as to what time zones would be, what towns would be in what time zones, occurred at a meeting in 1883 among the major railroad executives at the Grand Pacific Hotel in Chicago. And they took a map of the United States and they looked at how the rail lines ran and they divided the country into standard time zones, which explains why Chattanooga is on Eastern time because the railroads were so important to that transportation system. And we were so closely tied to New York with railroads and banking industry that we needed where we might, if you look geographically and you're drawing straight lines, but they didn't draw straight lines. They drew the lines to, to reflect the economy. Um, other inventions are gonna spur the spread of the railroad. So you've got George Westinghouse who will come up with the air brake. And the air brake um, was not just a brake that would stop the locomotive or stop a car, but it allowed the engineer to pull one brake that would begin braking all cars in that, in that train at the same speed they would begin to slow down. And that really allowed the trains to be more stable as opposed to, you know, ending up with some sort of a jackknife situation and cars being turned. You have the Pullman sleeping car that is invented, invented during this time period, which made long distance travel more comfortable. It also really created a new industry and that will be an industry that will be based on travel and tourism. Unless you were incredibly wealthy, which was you know, one to 2% of the American population prior to the American Civil War, you only traveled to visit family or you traveled to take goods to market or for some reason of that nature, we're gonna have this whole tourism industry as we begin to market the beauty of the country and you know, what you can do in the cities and all of that. The telegraph will be invented during this period of time and it certainly, um, one of the books I can remember reading years ago referred to the telegraph as the central nervous system of the railroad system. It would be used for communication and coordination. It was the way, you know, if a train broke down, how did you let the stations know the train broke down? And that was that normally you had a telegrapher on the train who could hook in, he could get off, hook his key into the line and could telegraph where they were, why they were broken down, how long it would take, so the trains could be held so that there would not be some sort of a calamity. Without the railroads, um, you know, it was sort of a, a symbiotic relationship. If the railroads hadn't been buying the land and clearing them for the railroads, there wouldn't have been a place for the telegraph poles because the telegraph poles are all gonna follow the railroad systems. If the telegraph poles had not been put near the railroads and that wire strung, then there would also, have not been that ability to communicate. So they're sort of, you know, brother and sister together. But there are some other new industries. And in the 
10 minutes or so we have left, I'm going to hit you with three of those that have had a tremendous impact on our nation, and that's our next slide. So you're, probably, you're going to see three guys that you've probably heard of all of your life. Andrew Carnegie, John D. Rockefeller, and J. Pierpoint Morgan. So uh, let's talk about those industries in particular that these three men will be so responsible for. And what you begin to see is that with the railroads, with the growth of steel, with the growth of petroleum, with the growth of banking and investment banking, all of that ties together. It becomes this woven thing. So um, the, the ability to create steel really transforms not only this nation, but transforms the world because what with steel, what you do is you take iron and you add one to 2% carbon. And what it does is it makes the iron stronger, but not as brittle and, and it can be much more functional and still becomes you know, the material that will be chosen for the railroad tracks. It'll be used as girders in the tall buildings and the bridges. You know, this is gonna be that age when we're first going to begin to really build skyscrapers. We're gonna be able to build much more massive bridges as opposed to the wooden bridges that we had had so often before or iron bridges that were notorious for rusting through and, and collapsing. Um, we're going to be building machine tools out of the steel. And that process had been available since prior to the American Civil War, but it was so blessed expensive. But once the Bessemer process is introduced in 1855, and we knew how to use the Bessemer process, which is the addition of adding oxygen to fuel the fires and, and higher heating points and everything, we're going to see the steel industry really expand. Um, it was disrupted, obviously, by the American Civil War, but the recovery is pretty quick. In 1870, we were, as a nation, producing about 77,000 tons of steel per year. By 1900, we are producing 11.4 million tons of steel per year. I mean, that you think about it, it's absolutely amazing. Pittsburgh becomes the steel producing capital of the nation, the steel producing capital, quite frankly, of the world. And part of that is really because they are so close to iron ore deposits and to coal mine, coal deposits, because you need that intense heat coming from the coal that can be fueled by the addition of oxygen and you need the iron ore. Um, the person that we most associate with the growth of, of steel industry is Andrew Carnegie. Carnegie, I think most all of us remember, was a poor Scottish immigrant who came to this nation and he began as a bobbin boy in a textile factory and he will end his life as the titan of the steel industry and U.S. steel. Um, Carnegie, you know, each of these titans will have areas in which they are concerned. For Carnegie, it's going to be literacy. So Carnegie libraries, Carnegie hospitals, but it really is education, funding of universities, funding of libraries, all those sorts of things. So, you know, with that increased industrialization, there is quite a bit of philanthropy that will come out of this. Uh, the second guy that you see pictured there is John D. Rockefeller, and Rockefeller is kind of a fascinating person. You know, there was no petroleum industry prior to 1859. None. You know, where people knew there was petroleum in the ground, at best, people were trying to figure out what to do with it. By 1866, the war ends, and we're producing two to three million barrels of petroleum a year. And it's primarily being used to replace kerosene in lamps or, or to make kerosene to fuel lamps, where in the past we've been using whale oil, and which is much more ex expensive and much more difficult to process. Um, it's interesting, by 1890, we're going to be producing 50 million barrels of oil per year. And it's going, it's going to be interesting because yes, we're still making kerosene from it, but the byproducts will become major um, factors in industrialization. A lot of the lubricants, the oils, um, the things that you need to keep 
machinery from so much friction as it you have metal on metal. Um, you're going to have gasoline as a byproduct coming out of this. You're going to have all sorts of waxes, things that are going to happen. And they learn how to do this because they learn to heat up the petroleum and it will produce this. The most dominant figure, obviously, in the petroleum industry is John D. Rockefeller, who incorporates Standard Oil in 1870 and then steadily began to buy off or force out of business all of his competitors. And by 1879, nine years later, he will own fully 90% of all of the oil refineries in the nation. Um, he's probably the most fascinating of these three men because he's just this study in conflicts. He is, you read anything about him doing business and he's referred to as cutthroat. Um, he is ruthless. And yet he's teaching Sunday school class every Sunday. He is a devout Baptist. You know, he, he is giving tremendous amounts of money to the church and everything. And everyone who's ever, every biography I've ever read of, of, of Rockefeller, you end up finishing it and going, talk about someone who could compartmentalize their lives. I mean, he was just such a fascinating, fascinating person. He will by 1900 be the richest man in America. And part of that is because he's the father of something that in industrial management we call vertical integration. And that means he owned every business from the oil wells themselves all the way up to every processing plant, the distributions, everything. He owns and controls it all, and therefore he doesn't have to share any of the wealth with anybody. And the final guy that you see there, J.P. Morgan, as J. Pierpoint Morgan, but J.P. as we refer to him so much today, he's, he's a little bit different. He grows up, he is wealthy, he is well-educated. He is an investment banker in New York, and he becomes this... He's referred to so often when I see things written about him as this gale force wind. He apparently was larger than life. He smoked, you know, most every biography says at least two dozen cigars a day. You know, just really this walking around, talking, stabbing the air, making deals. But he is the person who's going to put together the capital for the expansion in the railroads, the expansion in the the steel industry, the expansion in petroleum. When those guys needed a financier, it was J.P. Morgan. And J.P. Morgan will put those deals together. And of course, out of all of that profit that will be made, Morgan will himself become a key player in the economy. He will become one of the wealthiest men in the nation. So in the three minutes or so that we have left, um, the one thing that they do all come together and agree on is they don't like competition. And I say that because that's gonna lead us to where we're gonna be next week in talking. They believe that competition was wasteful and disorderly. And once you had someone who knew how to master that industry, then everybody else needed to get out of their way and let them do it. Well, you know, when there is no competition though, then it allows the person in charge of that segment of the economy to pretty much determine what the price will be and determine what the wages are because where else are workers going to come so we'll be talking about that next week um, they just believed in the consolidation of entire industries by 1901 u.s steel was the first billion dollar corporation that's one billion dollars in 1900 dollars um, and they are in many ways while the government is very nervous about them they also are considered to be great resources twice in the last part of, well, in 1895 and 1907, both during financial panics for the government, it looked like our economic system for the nation was gonna collapse. And in both cases, 1895 and 1907, JP Morgan was the one who was called to Washington to stabilize the financial system to to help them know how to move money, how to deal with rates and all those sorts of things to stabilize. So the question that I'll leave with you today is tremendous industrialization. We look from 1865 to 1900, the face of America changes. Now, predominantly people are still agrarian, but things are changing. The next slide will show you some of how it impacts those of us who are living here 
you know, just in the South. And that's, you know, how does the public react to all of this industrialization? Well, you've got people who are not happy because it looks like this democracy, this ability of everyone to become wealthy. Some people are becoming significantly wealthier than others and they don't like that. Uh, it seemed like a few wealthy men were controlling the economy, but then this idea that you could purchase so many goods at a cheaper price is pretty tantalizing also. So it's during this same period of time, 1880s beginning, that you're gonna have the rise of the mail order retail businesses. You know, so you, you might not be able to produce it in Whitwell, Tennessee or in Gainesboro, Tennessee, but you could order it and you've, for the first time, we're gonna have the production of catalogs, first pioneered by Montgomery Ward. It's the first major retail order business, then Sears Roebuck and Company. And they will be sending catalogs out to people where they live. You know, you'll get several catalogs in each community. You could order your house from Sears or from Montgomery Ward and it would come to you in a kit where you could assemble your entire house, which I just find so fascinating. And there are some of those houses actually still standing. Um, those mail order distributions will also use the railroads to get the goods to the people, or they'll use the US postal system to get goods to people where they live so that you don't have to go to the store, which was a totally different way. You know, you, in the past, you had produced it yourself. You went to your little neighborhood center now, those who had been, had been lured, west, lured west by the Homestead Act, they could still get some of the comforts of living back east. So that's fascinating too. Now, are there downsides to that? Well, of course there are. You know, what about those small town businesses that can't compete with someone like a Montgomery Ward or a Sears that's buying in such large quantities? So there's going to be an undermining of local businesses. That's really, the competition is going to really kind of gear up when you begin to have the very first supermarket system and that's A&P and that's an A&P grocery store picture in the center. In 1900, A&P had 200 grocery stores in the United States. In 1930, they had 16,000 grocery stores across the United States. And because they're buying in that sort of bulk directly canned goods from the store, from the uh, manufacturers and everything, it's going to really impact those small stores. So what's the moral of all of this? What are we gonna talk about next week? Well, the you know, with great benefits of the change to industrialization came some unanticipated outcomes and some costs. So, you know, you can market people who were really excited in the beginning because I can market my beef cattle on a larger region or I can market whatever it is I'm producing on a larger region. Once they begin to do that, realize that they are competing against other people who are also marketing on a larger region where they may have been dominant in a particular geographic area. And then there's going to be a lot written about how this standardization of time is going to change the way we live our lives from where families that live by the sun or by church bells, now they're finding themselves time controlled by other people and other institutions. So where we had always been sort of island communities, by the end of the 19th century, it's no longer true. We, are begin we still have some of those island communities, but more and more, we're finding those local communities impacted by the forces of politics, economy, culture, and most of that now will be controlled by Washington, D.C., New York City, Chicago, Dallas, and the other growing cities. So how, what's the reaction going to be? Our final slide, and then we are through for today. Our final slide is kind of where we're going next week, and that's so how much is too much of a good thing? Do, how much do we want consolidation? How much do we want urbanization? How much do we want industrialization? Is there a way that we can reap the benefits but limit the liability? So when we come back, not next week, because next week we're on spring break, but when we come back that um, first full week in April, we're going to be looking at 
how do we deal with such swift change, what seems like such swift change to those who were living at that point, who literally have gone from predominantly horses and wagons and buggies and all of that to railroads and ordering your groceries on, you know, through the mail. Uh, it's kind of fascinating. So that's where we'll be when we come back in April. We'll be looking at um, sort of some trust busting. How do you how do you balance all of those sorts of things? I see a, a couple of questions in the chat. Mm. Um, yes, I think I think you can say that, Tim. Steam engine invention, probably the key initiator. You know, James, there had been attempts at steam engines, but James Watts will have the first one that really can be can be utilized efficiently. It's not so uh, expensive to have those steam engines. And when we get to the part that we can really begin to have interchangeable parts so that we can fix things more readily, which will come out of the steel industry also. And we were talking about that tool making and all of that, that will really make a, a difference. And Tim says, why did Senate stupidly vote for year round daylight saving times? You know, that, that's such a debate. I, you hear it all across the nation now. I mean, really sunrise at 9 a.m. in the winter. The argument I have gone, when I've gone back and tried to research it, the argument initially was safety. It was for school children who were waiting for school in the dark with, you know, they're not being daylight in wintertime because of, of the way the sun rises. But, um, year round daylight saving with daylight time, you're exactly right. You know, I think most of us, as much as we have moved to clocks and we've moved to standardized time, it's amazing how much our, our humanness, I guess that's an appropriate word, our humanness actually reflects on light. You know, we tend to sunlight affects some of us even more than others but we tend to think of our days beginning with sunlight and ending with the sun going down even though we are now 120 years into clocks telling us that we shouldn't be living by the sun the truth of the matter is we do so it's all fascinating i'm anxious to see what actually happens um whether or not there will be a backlash but anyway back to you um, oh, okay. Our time is up. In fact, we are probably, my clock says we have one minute, which means we're probably <laughs> four minutes over because I need that's, to see my clock. But thank you fine. for being with me today. Uh, industrialization is fascinating. You know, it's with every good thing comes, with every great blessing comes a, a couple of burrs also. And we're going to really look at those burrs the next time.